Hello everyone, Razorblade Mango here. Yes, it is me in uh, talking to the camera again. No, this will, thankfully, this will not be a, a sad uh, or meditative video about me. This is going to be something a little bit different that I'm actually quite uh, excited to talk about. And it includes one of my uh, hobbies that I have recently rediscovered at the, the end of last year, the beginning of this year, and that would be reading. So as I've gotten older, I've actually started to kind of wean off, or at least I've been trying to wean off, wean off being in front of a screen all the time, and especially at, at night where it's, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm a lot better. I feel a lot better when I'm away from a screen sometimes during the day. Uh, at night, it actually helps me sleep a lot better if I don't be near a computer screen or a phone screen or a TV screen for the final hour or so of my night, if I can help it. So what I like to do to kind of just chill in general, especially in the evening, is to sit down and just read a good book. Um, this is not going to be a video about the books that I'm currently reading or anything like that, but I wanted to do a video where I talk about or I actually combine my my rediscovery of, of reading and the usual shit that I talk about on the channel, which is video games. So today I just wanted to give some recommendations about my I've chosen a few of my favorite video game themed books to talk to you guys about today. So I've only chosen four just for the sake of time, but there are, there are quite a few others that I quite like. And the first one that I want to talk about is called Jacked, the outlaw story of Grand Theft Auto by David Kushner. And I picked this book up. I don't remember exactly. It was quite a few years ago. It was It was around the time... I think it was before Red Dead 2 came out, actually, is when I picked this up. And I am obviously, if you've known me for a long time, whether in, in real life or on the channel, I am a big fan of Rockstar Games. I would consider them probably in my top three game developers of all time. I, I think they are masters of their craft, and I am always eager to learn about the history like or at least their how they go about you know researching for their games how they go about making them the, the struggles that went into it and of course their most iconic franchise is Grand Theft Auto so a book dedicated to learning about the history and the inner workings of Grand Theft Auto is something that I absolutely could not pass up on and thankfully this book lived up to my expectations I and I found so many of its insights quite interesting to read about and i think my favorite part of this book is i loved learning about the research that goes into creating the worlds of grand theft auto like how they went you know how they went to miami to explore and take pictures and interact with the locals when they were doing research for vice city how they went to how they went to actually like recruit gang members to do voiceovers for San Andreas, how they had to go, they, they visited multiple Russian bars in New York City. They had to be protected by bodyguards so these Russian gangsters wouldn't kill them because they were hanging out in these Russian mob bars. So, I, like, they put themselves in real actual danger to capture the authenticity of whatever kind of setting and, and vibe they want to they want to get. And I find that highly respect respectable. I, I I love that because you know Rockstar is obviously almost to an unhealthy degree obsessed with detail, obsessed with capturing the very specific vibes of the places that they are tackling in their games. And I think they nail it every time, especially when they go to California, which obviously is, is a place I'm very familiar with, considering I've lived here all my life. Whenever I play a game like San Andreas or I play Grand Theft Auto V, I look at their version of L.A. and California and I'm like, yes, this is just the vibe of it is nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. 
And then I've been in New York City. I've never been to Miami, but I've been in New York City, and I, I love the portrayal of New York City in Grand Theft Auto 4. I think they, they nailed it there, and I love learning about the, the inner workings of it. It's so much fun, and there's so many like cool little details and stories that are in this book. Um, I think my favorite one is when they had a former porn actress Jenna Jameson as a voice. I think it's one of the radios at one of the radio stations in Grand Theft Auto's Vice City, and they they were trying. It's detailed in the book, but they were trying to get her to make a noise as if she was like giving a blowjob, and they tried to kind of tell her in a, in a like very wishy-washy way the noise they wanted her to make they were like uh you know maybe if you were sucking on some chocolate or or whatever they were a little like timid to talk to her about like tr- ask jenna jameson to, like can you please make a noise like you're sucking a dick and she basically just responded like so you want me to sound like i'm sucking a dick and they went yeah basically <laughs> so it's, it's like come on guys you're acting you're asking a pornographic actress to fucking make a, a sex noise it's like come on just fucking ask her um, another one of my favorite little tidbits from the book is that there, because Rockstar is from the UK, when they do the initial script, they sometimes don't have the right l- regional like lingo or cultural lingo for certain things. Like for example, um, Rockstar was very uncomfortable, and he, and this extends even into Grand Theft Auto Five. They were always like very uncomfortable with the idea of like writing the n-word in their scripts which like if you played grand theft auto san andreas if you've played five they just let the fucking n-word just fly in those games because that's that's the dialogue that's that's how these people talk that's how like like franklin like cj like like all these characters in especially in like the la area that's that's just how they talk like i i don't know what 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 you expect so I think they even actively tried kind of like in, they, they I think they wrote mate or or wanker in the script and you had these like actual gang members like look at the script while they're in the booth and they're like no we're not we're not saying this shit like we're we're going to say the anywhere that's what we do and then and then they do it it's just you know it is what it is and it's it's not in the book but also one of my favorite little little anecdotes about the making of Grand Theft Auto 5 is that the actors who played Franklin and uh lamar they like went out of their way to say the n-word as much as possible just to like make the the writers like feel uncomfortable but they had to they had to like put their foot down with the the right the writers at rockstar and be like look you don't live here in la you are not a part of this culture i am we are this is how we talk this is how we're gonna do it you want authenticity then shut the fuck up and let us just throw the n-word out there like it's like it's going out of style you know so that's just what they do and and i i love learning about little details like that because what frustrates me about rockstar and they they try to do like the oh the rockstar mystique thing is that they're very caged up when it comes to talking about how they make games you know i i talk about how modern playstation is very much like the willy wonka chocolate factory that's that's my favorite analogy to make with them they're very secretive very hidden but Rockstar have directly, I think they've they've directly quoted as saying like we don't want people peeking inside the chocolate factory. We just want to, we just want to give people the Rockstar mystique of how these like massive hyper detailed games are made. We don't want people to know, and you know, they take it to the extreme compared to modern PlayStation. But hey, you know, they deliver results. So that's um. That's at least uh, that book, Jacked, the the outlaw story of Grand Theft Auto. Um, I'll have links to these books in the description if you guys want to check them out. But I, this is a good one, I think, to start off with. I, I highly recommend this book. It's a, lot, it's, it's a fun read, especially if you're a big Rockstar fan like I am. Um, I guess speaking of PlayStation, I was going to move on to a different book. But speaking of PlayStation, there's one book, there's one that I do want to recommend to people. Um, I don't have a hard copy of it because unfortunately I missed out on the the Kickstarter for it and I picked it up later from the from the author himself as a as a digital purchase and it's a book called It Only Did Everything 
the unofficial complete history of the PlayStation 3 by Sandeep Ray. So Sandeep Ray is, I would consider, a PlayStation historian. And I know he did a book about the Vita as well. He's currently, I think his current Kickstarter project is that he is bringing back the some kind of hard copy PlayStation magazine that people can kickstart and, you know, they'll get, I think every maybe four times a year or something like that. He's trying to basically bring, you know, the, the retro style video game magazines, which is something that I'm fascinated with. I think I missed out on the Kickstarter on that as well, but, but this is a book that I've really wanted to read because I find the history of the PlayStation three just absorbing because I was there. I remember in real time how that went down. And the PlayStation 3 is, because I'm a big PlayStation nerd, is that the, the PlayStation 3 is such a fascinating history for me because I think it represented the the absolute low point in the company's history. Just that initial year, year and a half of the PlayStation 3's existence and then the lead up into it, which was just painful to watch. As somebody who grew up playing on the the PS the PS2 and, and to a lesser extent the PS1, but I remember things like you know this will be it'll be five ninety nine US dollars for the PS3 and I and I remember the quotes is like oh you'll want to get a second job to get this console and it's just like oh my god what are you guys doing like that was when like, if you think Sony is arrogant now which I do think they are. That's this is like way worse back then in like 2005, 2006. It was just like, what are you guys doing? What, what are you guys doing? And they just totally fucked it up for uh, quite a few years at the beginning of that generation. And they they basically just handed Xbox and Nintendo the lead. They're like, oh, here you go. Here's the generation. But the book, I think, is great because it really goes into meticulous detail about how PlayStation fucked up in the beginning, how they course corrected, and how they eventually did end up at the, at the very end of the generation selling more units than the Xbox 360 did under, under Microsoft. And it's it's a it's a great read because it's all about because again, like it, it personally for me is because I lived it. I was there throughout most of that generation. I didn't buy into like I would say like little little less than half of the generation just because I did not want to spend $600 on a PS3. That was not happening. I don't care what games got announced for it. I don't care if Metal Gear 4 got announced for it. That is not, nah, no way. Not for a, not for a 13, 14 year old kid. Uh, uh not happening. And if I had asked my mom, like, oh, can you spend $600 to buy a PS3? She probably would have told me to go fuck myself. She probably would have laughed in my face and said, no, are you kidding me? You have a job? That ain't happening. <laughs> so I love this book, though. Not only does it go into the history of the PS3, but it has uh, guest authors where they talk about the, the most defining games from the PlayStation 3 era. Things like the Uncharted series, things like Metal Gear 4, Resistance, uh, Killzone 2 and 3. Uh, even third party stuff like they have a section on Bioshock. They have, I think they have a section of en Enslaved Odyssey to the West, which I think is an underappreciated game. Um, there's lots of stuff. It's it's like a treasure trove of information and insight and retrospectives if you're a big PlayStation fan like me. So um, I highly recommend it. And, and if you just go to the author's page on Etsy, it's only, I think it's only $10, $15 when all is said and done. And the guy just, if, as long as you provide your email address and your Etsy account, you'll get emailed a, a zip file of the game and like a little personalized message from the author himself. I mean, he basically like sent like, oh, dear Adam, thanks for, thank you so much for buying my book. I hope you enjoy. And I thought that was really cool. Just getting it from Etsy. I, I wish I had a hard copy of it. And if he did offer extra hard copies on his Etsy, I would I would have bought it for like thirty, forty dollars. I, I definitely would have. I would have loved to have had that as a hard copy. But it's better to have it as a digital 
copy then did not have it at all so again i highly recommend it it's called it only did everything the unofficial complete history of the playstation 3 go check it out on sandeep ray's etsy i'll have a link in the description if you're interested in this book um next book that i want to talk about is actually from a controversial controversial author uh blood sweat and pickles pixels this one um look by Jason Schreier. Look, I have I have a lot of th- negative things to say about Jason Schreier, but when it comes to writing, the guy can spin one hell of a story. Like I I really I love his writing. Um, my personal feelings on the guy himself aside, but I think he's a damn good author. And this is a book about the turbulent development of certain video games. It has stories that are things like. Uh, how Eric Barone worked on Stardew Valley and that whole thing. It's got a section on the canceled 1313 from Star Wars. It's got the making of Uncharted 4, which that that whole thing is its own. I, I think a whole book could be written about the making of Uncharted 4, just how that went down. How How, like, there's so much, like dirt that hasn't come to the light that behind the scenes when it comes to the making of that that game uh it has a section on destiny and the, the whole turbulent development of that it's got the witcher 3 in there but i love it i, I think it's a great book uh, i haven't yet i actually have it uh, ordered right now at the time of this video recording this video his um newest book which i think is called press reset and it's all about the the failures it's basically like this except the failures this is more of a most of the book the the games that he talks about in this are success stories like despite their turbulent development like uncharted 4 like the witcher 3 like stardew valley but there's some in here like uh star wars 1313 which obviously never saw the light of day um they talk about dragon age inquisition i think it's either dragon age 2 or dragon age inquisition oh let me check just real quick Dragon age inquisition yeah and how the how Bioware basically wanted that game to fail because the the practices of, of how what they had to go through to make it were so strenuous and so aggressively like uh, just it, it sounds awful just working in the video game industry when you're when you're reading about conditions like this and not not every game has developments like these but man when you when you read some of the stories in this book it. It really does make you appreciate the games all the more. Uh, and this this also has one of my personal favorite uh, video game creation stories in Stardew Valley, which I, I've talked about. I've talked about how much I respect Eric Barone on the the Why I'm Excited for Haunted Chocolatier video. But this is the, if you want to learn about the making of Stardew Valley, this is probably outside of there's a there's a documentary about it on YouTube as well. That, that's great. Not officially sanctioned by Eric Barone, but it, it's I love learning about the making of Stardew Valley just because I find Eric Barone's story and how he worked on it for five plus years, almost exclusively by himself, to be just so inspiring and just man, it, it's just it's it's amazing how talented certain people are out there. And I wish the video game industry was not as as fucked up as it is to where People like it. And I'm sure there are plenty of Eric Barones out there that, given the opportunity, could probably make a really amazing game. But because of this fucking awful, especially the the AAA video game industry, it's just it's not an environment that is conducive to like really outside the box. Unless you're an Artur, unless you're somebody like Kojima or uh, Ken Levine or uh, Yoko Taro, like somebody who was able to get financial results. But people that just want to make weird shit for the sake of weird shit probably get sucked into the soulless machine and never get the opportunity to make the things that they want to make. And this book kind of details why that happens, which sucks. Uh, the, the one caveat I do have to bring up with this book is that some of the information is fielded from anonymous sources, which I am always like, mm. I take anonymous sources with a grain of salt a little bit. But the book itself has some excellent stories. Just love it. Love reading about the inner workings of the video game industry. And um, I don't, I, I'm sure Press Reset is going to be a lot more of a, de- a depressing read than this is. 
because like I said, this is Blood, Sweat, and Pixels is more about the success stories, and Press Reset um, is going to be all about the failure. So I'm I'm looking forward to reading that. And then the final book that I want to talk about for this video is a video that I've or sorry, it's a book that I've actually brought up on the channel before, like a few years ago, when I did the great um, the massive Final Fantasy VII remake video, and that is uh, the Legend of Kingdom Hearts Volume One by uh, I'm I'm just gonna say <laughs> George or J in quotes uh, Gruard. It's a French guy, and I, I suck at pronouncing French names, so I, I'm very sorry if I butchered that. So I really feel like this why this is here kind of needs no explanation, but. Uh, for those, uh, if you're seeing this for the, this channel for the first time for this video, um, I'm a ride or die Kingdom Hearts fan. I have been since I was uh, 13. Yeah, 13. That's when I played Kingdom Hearts 2 for the, the first time. And really fell in love with the series and that. And this is all about the creation of the games leading up to Kingdom Hearts 3. Um, this book is almost like a cock tease to me because there are two other volumes after this actually four there are, are, are no so one two three three sorry three other volumes after this one that go into more of the detail of i think probably the like point two fragmentary passage and kingdom hearts three like the history behind that because the guy actually talks to nomura like he gets direct quotes from nomura for this book and I, I, it's rare because Nomura doesn't talk extensively about Kingdom Hearts very often, at least not in this sense, where you could write a whole book about it. He's, he's kind of like a, he, he's a guy who keeps his cards close to his chest, but for this guy, um, I, I guess he was willing to talk to Jay Gerard <laughs> for this book, but Similar to the book about the PS3, if you are a longtime Kingdom Hearts fan like I am, this book is just, man, it, it, it is just a wealth of, of information and, and the behind the scenes nitty gritty of these games and just the, the, the drama and the history that goes on behind it. And it really goes into the detail of, you know, the genesis of the series, what led to the decisions behind, you know, Sora's design and certain worlds that need to be used, how Nomura was such a badass that he basically told Disney no when they brought up their ideas for what they wanted Kingdom Hearts to be, because it's they obviously wanted initially they wanted Kingdom Hearts to you know, star Mickey Mouse and all that shit. But Nomura basically, after he was done listening to the Disney executives at the time, you know, throw their ideas out there, kind of with this air of assumption that's like you will this is not us suggesting this is what you will do because this is their ip and nomura had the the fucking balls to be like no actually that's not what we're doing and he presented his own like weird ideas for kingdom hearts and because he was so like insistent on it because kingdom hearts is his baby they were just like oh, okay you know th there's some pushback obviously from certain things from disney and it's a very much like a like a push and pull kind of relationship that they have but it worked out and we got the original kingdom hearts which is a, a classic not only from the, the ps2 era but just from it's classic in its own right kingdom hearts 2 which is again classic in its own right my favorite game ever um i love this book and i also love the how this book is structured in certain areas i think my favorite part of this book as far as the the creative structure of it is that to keep in the theme of how dream drop distance you switch between Sora and Riku at like timed intervals. He has a section in this book that's dedicated to the creation of dream drop distance. That's in the style of it where he'll be talking about one subject for a certain length of time. And then it just stops to kind of mimic, you know, how like you run out of time playing a Sora in that game and it switches to Riku. And he does the same thing where he goes, back and forth with the subjects and it stops at like random moments to 
echo how the game is. And I, I think that's very creative. I, I, I love that personally. I think I can see how that would be frustrating for certain people, but I I love how that that section of the book is structured. Um, I also love I also find some like really interesting details in this book. Like this author really does not. <laughs> He, uh, he he does not really like Naoki Yoshida or Yoshi P and the author kind of goes into detail about how there was some initial friction between Yoshi P and Nomura because of the circumstances regarding Final Fantasy versus 13 which th if you guys don't remember that was originally going to be what became 15 versus 13 was originally going to be directed by Nomura because he wanted to make a an original Final Fantasy game in the Crystal Novalis saga that was part of the, the 13 trilogy and initially 15 but there was all this drama around it uh because of the the spectacular failure of the 1.0 of Final Fantasy 14 online so Square Enix had to run damage control and and basically went into panic mode when it came to salvaging 14 online so when yoshi p came in when he presented his vision of how we're going to save 14 and what basically become realm reborn and then the, the juggernaut that 14 is today that was at the the cost of versus 13 and this book kind of goes into detail about that whole saga as well so it's not only a book that's about the legend of kingdom hearts it's about nomura himself as a creator and that is a very rare peek behind the curtain so and i greatly appreciate that as somebody who loves the series i, I love nomura's creative vision for a lot of it and uh it was fascinating to read about that because the, the author doesn't have a he th he i don't know how he feels now but at the time of re writing this book he thinks yoshi p is very overrated as a as a creator <laughs> so that was interesting. It was a little interesting opinion to get. And yeah, it, it just goes into very aspects about the, the creation of certain games and you know behind the scenes at Square Enix and Nomura's creative team and how he the guy is basically a workaholic when it comes to the series. So the book goes into a lot of detail about that. And I highly recommend it. But what's so frustrating about this book is that because it's so good, I really want to read, I mentioned earlier that it's kind of a cock tease, because when you read this book, you'll really want to read the other three volumes that come after it, but they're only available in French, so they have not been localized in English yet. I hope they will someday. Um, I've actually reached out to the author to see, like, hey, are there any, is there any, like, thing in the works as far as the English? I never heard back from the guy, but uh, maybe I'll try again after done with this video but uh i if you're if you can speak french you can read french great you you've got three more volumes of this to to go through after you're done reading this but uh if you don't yeah you're kind of screwed you kind of have to wait for the three volumes to be localized in english which mm, i don't know if that's uh when that will happen or if that will ever happen so there you go that's my final recommendation for now um yeah so if if any of these books interested you guys wa listening to this watching this i have the links in the description box go check them out and um yeah that's it i just wanted to have a short little casual conversation about some of my favorite video game themed books there are obviously more but I'll, I'll maybe get to those another day so yeah anyway thank you all so much for watching and i'll see you guys next time later